Hello everyone, in this tutorial in this three part series, we'll be converting our triangles from previous tutorial into this 3D rotating mesh. This is loaded from a GLTF file and in the end of this tutorial we'll be visualizing the normals and using a depth buffer to make sure everything is working correct. So to get started, we'll be using this new GLTF library. This will be used for loading our GLTF file. For the GLTF file, for this tutorial itself. You can get it from the GitHub repo. It will be in assets and it will be here. GitHub repo is down in the description below. Then into your own project, make a new folder called assets or whatever you want to call it and paste the 3D model down there. If you double click on the 3D model, you can see using the Windows 3D file viewer that it will look something like this. So you can use this to see if you will are drawing the right model if you have your own model. So what we'll do, we'll create a new file called model.rs. In this file, we'll be doing all the model loading and we'll create the structs which represent our model. What we'll do then is we'll also include this in our main. Nice. So every model is made out of of a bunch of meshes. So our model struct will look something like this. So it will have a vector of all our meshes and it will have a vector of all our materials. Then our material will look something like this. So most materials, uh, they have a lot more properties. For now, we're only interested in the base color. Later, we can load more and more. Uh, in reality, there are like 20 different properties to most uh, physically based materials. Then we'll have our mesh. So a single model can have multiple meshes. If the artist decides to split it up, that can be good for performance. Let's say a model is very large. Maybe you have an entire house as a model, then you want the material to be different meshes, let's say. So a single mesh has a vector of vertices, then a vector of indices, how to index in those vertices, because we might want to reuse the same vertex multiple times and we don't want to duplicate the data. And then the material index. Same reason, let's say you have 20 meshes, but the first 10 meshes use material number A, and the second 10 meshes use material number B. You don't want to duplicate the material, so that's why they just index into this vector. And then finally, our vertex will be represented as the following. For now, we'll be only using a 3D position and a 3D normal vector. Later, you could also add tangents, colors, um, and texture coordinates, of course, that's the one we'll be using next video to display any textures on our 3D mesh. Also implemented the default rate for our vertex. So the default position will be zero, our default normal will also be zero. And then for actually loading the model, I already pre-typed most of this because it's not actually really part of our 3D graphics from scratch. It's just a nice utility to have. You can just copy this code over. I will go over it quickly so you have a rough understanding of how it all works. So what we can do is I create a function called load model. It takes a file path to where our model is and it will return a model. Then what we can do using the GLTF library, we can say import, this is our file path and we get a result back. So make sure the result looks okay. Then we get the document. This document, as you can see, to a GLTF file is basically a large JSON file describing all the materials, the buffers, the images and their path. So the images we'll be using next tutorial, they're just stored separately as different JPEGs you can view. Then the actual vertex and index data is stored in this giant binary file. And it says here's the binary file and this is how many bytes you need. And this is how long this section of vertex data is. And this is the offset and etc, etc, etc. So we can load our JSON data, our document, then the actual buffers, and finally the images, we won't be using them for now. We'll create an empty array of meshes, uh, a filled array of materials with the default material. But we also need to implement the default rate of our material. So the default base color, for now, I would advise make it one, because that would mean it's purely white, otherwise it's purely black, and that might be a bit hard to debug. Maybe otherwise my model not showing, no, it's showing it's just using the default material with the weird color. So if the material is empty, of course we want some material, even if the model doesn't provide any, so just create a default material anyway. 
And then if there is at least one node in our GLTO file, we'll process that node. Then finally, it will, uh, the process node will uh, parse our data into our meshes and materials vectors, and then we'll return a model. So the process node function, it's a little bit chunky, but it's doable if you read over it step by step. So GLTF nodes can contain multiple uh, different things. Sometimes a node is just actual geometry in a mesh, but sometimes it's also a point light or a directional light, or it says, hey, the camera should be here. So it can have multiple types of data. It's not only purely geometry data. So we'll skip all the other data. If we have a node, we'll make sure it contains a mesh. Then we'll loop over all the primitives. So a single mesh can have multiple types of primitives, which is a bit confusing, but in most cases it only has one primitive. Then we'll make sure that's triangles. The other different primitive types are lines, points, and different configurations for our lines and triangles. We'll only support triangles for now. This is probably what most GLTF files online have anyway. Then we'll create a reader closure to make life a bit easier. And then we'll load our actual vertex positions. So we can read them, they come back as a result. We'll make sure they're parsed okay. And then we can map them because there are three uh, yeah, there are an array of F32s and we want them as factories. Luckily, there's a conversion function. We'll collect them oh, to make this a bit cleaner. Instead of doing this, we can actually just say explicitly what we want here. That might be a bit nicer. Then we'll create our vertices. For now, we only have a position. Then we'll collect them. The rest is initialized with default. And what we can do then is we can load our actual normals. We'll add them to a vertices, so we'll say this vertex has this normal. Again, there are F32s in an array, so we just need to cast them to vec3. And then we load our final indices. And then we can have our material. So this PBR material has a bunch of properties, but for now we're only interested in the base color. As you can see, this also has the base color texture, a metallic factor, a metallic roughness texture, and if you look into your assets folder, you can see we actually have all those textures. A model is not required to have all of those. It can only have an albedo texture. So this is basically the base color, but this one is even have emi has emissive, excuse me. So this is the parts of the model which will glow. It has some pre-baked amine occlusion, a normal texture and a metallic roughness. This texture decides which parts should be metallic and which parts should be rough. So using a single texture, you can basically describe any material from shiny plastic until a rough metal, which is very neat. And then we'll push the, all this data into a new mesh, into our meshes array. So now that we have our GLTF loading complete, we can test it out by make sure you do this outside our while loop. Say model, it is load model. And then our file path. Make sure this file path is correct, otherwise you will get an error in runtime. So for me, it will be assets, damaged helmet, damaged helmet.gltf. Make sure you point to the gltf files. All the other files are linked inside the gltf file. If I run this now, you'll see that we get the same result, except loading will take a bit longer. So during this bit longer loading, it's loading the gltf file and all these things. So nice, but now, now we have a bunch of points again, as we did before, but they're in 3D space. How do we map those 3D points into 2D space? In order to get them from 3D to 2D space, we can apply three matrices. So as you can see here, we have a cube as our model and our cone as our camera. First, we apply the model matrix, which will translate scale and rotate our cube or our model from model space to world space. After this, we can apply the view matrix to transform the cube from world space to camera space. And then finally, we apply the projection matrix to create depth. So now that we know all about matrices, we can use them to transform our points from 3D to 2D space. First of all, we'll create our model matrix. So for our model matrix, for now, we can just leave it as an empty matrix. You cannot say zero because that won't actually uh, that will actually affect when you multiply other matrices by it. We will use the identity matrix. Then for the view matrix, where the camera should be, we'll say mat4 from translation and we'll move the camera back a few units. So on the x-axis it will be normal, the y as well, but on the z-axis we'll move the camera back 3.5 units. 
Then for our projection matrix, so this is where all the magic actually happens, we'll use perspective, RH, which stands for right-handed. We'll be using the right-handed coordinate system. Then the field of view, this is in radians, beware. So we'll say 60.2 radians. Then we'll need our aspect ratio. For now, I'll just say one, but of course, when we resource our window, we should recreate the projection matrix in here with a new aspect ratio. Otherwise things will look weird. Our near tipping plane, 0.01 will do for now, and our bar, something like 300. Okay, now we can create our MVB matrix by multiplying all of these in the correct order. The order really matters, otherwise you will get totally different results. Uh, they will be multiplied from right to left because of how the uh, the column or the row major uh, is defined in this math library. So you need to multiply the proje projection matrix by the view matrix by the model matrix. So what this will do, it will go from right to left. So we have our 3D point inside model space. Then we multiply it with the model matrix. Now it will be in world space. So let's say our model is rotated and translated and scaled a little bit. Now it's in the world space. Then of course it needs to be multiplied with the view matrix because if the camera goes up, basically all models go down if you think about it. So that's what the view matrix does. And then finally, we need to apply a projection so that uh, objects further away from the camera will actually be smaller. So that's what the projection matrix does. And according to the field of view, uh, it will project differently. And also the near and the far clipping plane, basically everything closer than 0.01 units to the camera will not be shown. Everything further away than 300 units will also not be shown. So nice, now that we have our magic uh, matrix, we can use that to draw our, well, triangle, not really. Now we want to draw a model. So let's create a new function and call it draw model. And from there we can then call it draw triangle. So draw model, this will take in our frame buffer, it will take in our model, and it will take in our MVP matrix. Okay. What we can do then is replace this old function with draw model, with our, uh, our frame buffer, our model, and our MVP matrix. Okay, nice. So again, you could draw as many models as you wanted, but for uh, showcase reasons, we want for now. What we need to do then is we need to loop over all the meshes inside our model. So for every mesh in model meshes, we'll need to take uh, oh, so yeah, we need to take a reference here for model meshes. Then we can loop over all the indices because they decide how the vertices should be accessed, our 3D points. So for the index of the index, bit confusing, hold on. For all the indices that length. We'll go by pair of three again, just like we did when we looped over these. And our vertex zero will be mesh.vertices, mesh.indices, which holds the actual index. And then I need to cast it as a U size. And this, of course, goes by pairs of three every iteration. And then we can use that for the first, the second, and the third vertex. And these three together make our triangle, but now in 3D space, loaded from our neat CLTF model. So what we can do then, we can call draw triangle. We'll modify our draw triangle function a bit. So instead of actually taking two dimensional points, we'll take three dimensional points. So if we modify this, let's get these on some nice new lines, get everything organized. I'll replace them by saying they will take vertex zero, vertex one, and vertex number two. Then in here, we can just call our draw triangle function, which needs our frame buffer, of course, v0, v1, v2, and any color. So let's for now just make it something like that, and we'll pass these in by reference. So now, of course, in this function, we need to convert our 3D points, uh, which are positions, into 2D space, so we can 
actually use the edge function and get something on the screen. To do that, we'll create a new function called project. So what project will do, oh, excuse me, we also need our MVP matrix to actually well, get them into 2D space. So we'll pass this in as well. And now we can create a function. So I'll call it project and it will basically well, yeah, project them from 3D space all the way into 2D space. We'll get our 3D point. What we'll do then is we'll get our MVP matrix and we'll return our 2D point, but our 2D point will still be as a fact 3 because we need the Z component to later use a depth buffer. Because even though it's in 2D, some pixels in 2D are closer to the screen than other pixels. We'll see what I mean later on. And we'll also um, export the reciprocal uh, of our W, as we'll see in a moment, because we'll need it later for calculation. So our projected position will be our MVP matrix, we need to dereference it, multiplied with our position, but it needs to be as effect 4, because you cannot multiply effect 3 with a mat 4, you can only multiply effect 3 with a mat 3, which means a mat 4, so we need to make it effect 4. And then, very important, so we dereference our position, but then the W value of this effect 4 should be 1. If you make this zero, this multiplication, multiplication will not do any translation, so it will only rotate and scale. If you're rendering something like a skybox, this, that's actually very handy. But of course, we also want to move our object around in space, so we'll use one. Then this will be one minus our result. So this will basically correct our depth and make sure that if we have a larger screen with the same aspect ratio that all the pixels are in the in the same place so that everything scales nicely we'll then correct our projected position by multiplying it with one divided by the w and why i made this variable intermediate because we could have just divided it by w immediately is because we need to keep this for calculations later so we'll return effect 3, we don't need the W component anymore, and we'll use, um, oh, we can do this a bit easier. This library actually has swizzles, so we can say dot .xyz, discarding the W component, and there you go. So this will be our projection function, and what we can do then in here is we can actually project. So when we project, we get in our three vertices and we want to project them into clip space. If the blue square portrayed here would be our screen, then the following would be clip space. So it will go from negative one to one. But if we take our screen space, it's quite different. It goes from zero to one and notice how the Y axis goes down as it increases. Now that we know the difference between clip and screen space, we can actually convert our three positions into two D positions. So let's call this vertex zero clip space and we'll call project with reference to our first vertex position and to our MVP matrix. Then we need to do the same for our other two vertices. Be sure to change these as well. Okay, so now they're in clip space, but as we saw earlier, they still need to go into screen space. Otherwise things won't, won't match up. So what we can do, we can write another function called clip to screen space. And this function is a bit more complicated than this function. I think this is the most confusing function, uh, but once you wrap your head around it, it's quite logical. And after that, most of the magic is just plain math. So first we'll grab a point in clip space, then we'll need our screen size in pixels. So for us, this will be 512. 12 unless you resize it and we'll dereference our clip space multiply it by minus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 and then we'll multiply this by dereference screen size oh yeah and we return our new point okay so now that we have that out of the way 
we can store these new variables. Let's say screen size. Let me make a vector of this first. So this will be uh, frame buffer width as of 32. Frame buffer dot height as of 32. And we can now store our new variables vertex zero in screen space equals clip the screen space with our v0 clip space and our screen size um, and this also needs to be a reference oh yeah of course uh, we only need the x and y component am i right oh yeah and of course this is a tuple so we need to get the first because we don't need our uh, magic reciprocal we only need the first factory and then we need to get xy do this for your other two vertices as well so we have a nice triangle again otherwise they get very lonely and then basically these are our two-dimensional um, points of our triangle and screen space so we can adapt this function a little bit so it will work again um, so we can remove these we won't need these anymore and our minimum will now be our v0 in screen space this is basically a this is b and this is c we just renamed them so in screen space with these followed by these then we need to multiply our so this one oh we don't need this anymore because we already did that in here we just shifted that calculation basically to another point in our code but uh, they cannot go below zero but they can go beyond one now they shouldn't go beyond our um, yeah the, the amount of pixels we have on our screen so instead of from zero to one we now mapped it from zero to screen width and screen height or frame buffer width and frame buffer height so in here we'll use screen size instead of one. This will stay exactly the same, but our point P again, we don't need to divide because it's already, it's not from zero to one um, or we don't want them from zero to one. I should say it like that. So we can just have points like this and then just Y as an F32. Then if we check if it's inside our triangle so this code which is actually a small piece of code i want to move it here because the results of a0 a1 and a2 will need them as well and we could also return those inside the tuple but it's just a bit messy so let's move that into this into here we need to rename our variables again unfortunately so as you remember um, a was v0 b was v1 and c was v2 and of course they all need to be greater than zero check for that in a second uh, so b will be v1 and we have another b here a was v0 we have one here and we have one here and c equals now v2 just bring in the variables then these need to be by the way reference same goes here and then finally point b still uh, also needs to be a reference nice then oh 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 skill shoe okay yeah there we go so now we basically move that function to here with our new variable names and what we can do then is it's inside it's just a one is larger than zero zero and uh, yeah and a two is larger than zero, zero so again exactly the same as previous tutorial and if it's inside we want to draw our color so i think we should be good to go to give this a test run I'm feeling confident. So let's see. Did we manage to do it? And there you go. So um, we still have a few artifacts, to be honest. 
let's fix those. First, to make things a bit clearer, I will make the model rotate. In order to make our model rotate, in here I'll create a timer. A timer will just be system time now. And what we can do then is, oh yeah, of course, as the uh, prefix import. Yes, so the thing we had to do was import as the deep time system time. And we can then every frame, let's move this into the wall loop. These calculations are not that heavy, so it's fine to have them inside our wall loop. And then we can get our elapsed time. Since we start our application by saying timer dot elapsed dot, uh, was it unwrap dot s seconds f32. So now we have the elapsed time as f32, and we can then say from axis angle, so this will rot create a rotation matrix for our model. And we first need to supply the axis of how we want to rotate our model. So I want to rotate it around the up axis. So let's say it's x3 0010000. Zero, 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 zero. So this will be the y axis, which stands for up. And then the amount of radians, and that will just be elapsed time. So if we run it now again, you can actually see a nice rotating 3D model. Very nice. So for these artifacts, how to fix them? We can fix them uh, two ways, but one can cause a crash. So we can or make this these inclusive of the last, but right now it doesn't really take into account the minimum of the screen size. So let's say our model would be completely on the right side of the screen or completely on the bottom. It would crash so a better way to do this oh, excuse me a better way to do this would be um in here just before we say uh, take the minimum of this one and our screen size add one unit here so it will still go one unit further except we are at our at the border of our screen so we don't crash we don't go out of bounds so as you can see now looks a lot better doesn't it but on the thumbnail, we had it displaying our normals. And some of you more familiar with OpenGL know when you actually have your normal of your pixel, you could do very cool lighting calculations and an exterior of your textures. And wow, all very exciting. So I'm afraid getting our normal is quite some work because as you know, every vertex has a normal, but then we need to interpolate between those vertices using barycentric coordinates. If we take our triangle on our point, we can use the three results of our edge function and assign them to lambda 0, 1, and 2. And we can be sure they always add up to 1 as long as the point is inside the triangle. We can then use this to calculate the final normal by multiplying every vertex normal with their according lambda. So now that we have a basic understanding of barycentric coordinates, we can still first check if we're, this pixel is inside our triangle. That will save us some performance and we don't want to use any unnecessary calculations. And we can then calculate the reciprocal of our area of our triangle. We'll do that by saying 1 divided by and our famous add function. But as a difference, we don't say two vertices and then our point. But we can just say all three vertices, of course. Because that will just calculate the area. So now we, that we have 1 divided by our area, we can actually set up our barycentric coordinates. So, barycords. Sounds like a cool name for jazz club, or I don't know. And then we'll say a0, a1, a2. So that will basically say how close am I to the edge from uh, a, yeah, the, the first edge, the second and the third edge. And we'll multiply that with 1 divided by our area. Okay, nice. So now that we have our barycentric coordinates, we can take our normals and we have to do one thing first. I'll show you how it looks without. Um, so we'll get normal from vertex zero or up n zero. And I'll use this. Um, yeah, so this will be a factor three. Uh, well, this will actually be our first normal and then we'll say that normal. I'm typing it uh, like this with this indirection because we'll need to do something here later. 
So we have our three normals as factories, and now we will need to interpolate them uh, depending on where our pixel is on the triangle. So our actual normal will be our first normal times, and that's why we kept these around all that time, our good friends, and we'll use the second or the, the yeah the, the second variable in our tuple. Our cool magic number one divided by the w of our projection position and we'll multiply that by our recent coordinates dot x then we'll add to that this exactly the same but then for normal number one and then again the same for normal number two oh, excuse me so one two Vertex number one, vertex number two, and bear central coordinates y, and bear central coordinates z. Then we can say, um, yeah, let's first see how it looks like this. So we need to convert this to a color because uh, a normal is always a normalized vector, but it's always in the range of minus one to one because if it looks up, will be 0, 1, 0, but if it looks down, it will be 0, minus 1, 0. Same for left, right, forward, back. So what we need to do is we can say normal as a color, and we'll use our normal, but we'll shift it in the range to 0, 1, times 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5. This is just purely for visualization reasons, and now it's between 0 and 1. We want it between 0 and 255, because we're going to use a UA to visualize it. So we can do it like that. And then instead of our lame color, lame, we can say from U or B, and we can say normal color dot x is U8 dot y is U8 dot z is U8. And if we take a look now, There you go but it, it's not really quite the normals we want as you can see the normals are rotating with the model and as some of you might know normals should be in world space so if the model is rotating the normals should stay the same because world space doesn't rotate to fix this you need to multiply your normals with the inverse transpose of the model matrix so how do we calculate this if we go back here we can create a new variable called inverse transpose model matrix and it's as easy as model matrix dot inverse dot transpose i won't go over the exact math on why this is but for now just assume it and then we can also pass this into here and we also need to pass it in here and then finally we can also pass it in here <clears throat> and then when we're getting our normals we need to store them as a vec4 because you can only multiply a matrix for by a vec4 so we'll store those oh it's not taking it very well the w component here will be zero Um, yes, very nice. Oh, it's not taking it. Expect for round one. Oh, yeah, excuse me. It should be from. And then we can multiply these with our inverse transpose model matrix. So we dereference our inverse transpose model matrix. And we'll multiply these by our normals. But now these are vec fours. And we want them, of course, to be a vec3 again. So this won't, well, yeah, this won't work. So what we'll say, we'll say dot x, y, z. And for good measurement, we'll also normalize this because normal should always be normalized. If we run this now again, you will see that our normals, very nice. So as you can see, our red normals are always staying on the left. 
our blue are always facing the front and our green is always facing up. But you will see a new issue. Some objects are not drawn in the correct order. To solve this, we'll need a depth buffer. So, a depth buffer is basically the same as a frame buffer, but it only stores floats going from zero to one. Zero meaning this pixel is occupied by something very close and one meaning this, this pixel is occupied by something very far away. So to create that, we'll create a new uh, yeah, we'll say depth buffer, which will just be a frame buffer, why not? And we'll say window.framebuffer.width, window.framebuffer.height. Of course, this one also needs to be resized, so we'll check for that later. We'll pass in our depth buffer as well when we draw our model. And our depth buffer, we'll I'll come to that later. It's funny to see what happens if you don't. So our depth buffer again will be a neutral frame buffer. Pass it to here as well. And then finally, we'll add it here. So now that we passed it down the chain of functions we created, we can check. So if we're inside our triangle, that's the first check we want to do. Then we're going to, oh yeah, we can still do the same thing. So we'll calculate our barycentric coordinates. And then we can create how, how far away from the camera we are. Already multiplied by the projection matrix, of course. So our Z will be, and that's why we kept these around, and that's why these are effect three. This will be our clip space, and then the first in the tuple dot z times our barycentric coordinates dot x and then this one plus same but now for the next and here we go uh yeah this would be like that by the way feel free to align your code however you like this is just what i do to make it more readable for myself and then First, second, and third vertex Z multiplied by the person to coordinates X, Y, and Z. This way we can again interpolate between the depth of all three triangle points. And what we can do then, so this will basically be our Z we want to store in our buffer. We don't need these brackets. And then we can read the current depth of this frame. So what's the closest point? until now the closest pixel until now we've drawn so we can say depth buffer but now we have a slight problem because we're only we cannot get anything so let's go into our window dot rs and go into our frame buffer so to solve this what we can do we can create a new function but we want them as f32s luckily for us they're stored as u32s so that means they take up the same amount of bytes so we can just cast back and forth so we'll create a new function called set pixel takes ourselves and I'll just copy this one it's a bit easier but we'll call it f32 and our value will be an f32 so how do we do this <coughs> we'll multiply this value by the maximum value of a u32 as an f32 as a u32 so this way the range of our float will be matched into the range of a u32 uh, from 0 to 1 because we know this float will be between 0 and 1 uh, for floats beyond that range this won't work But we'll specifically use this for a depth buffer and cast it back to u32 Then we also need to get our value So we can say get pixel 32 we'll Return an f32 And what we can say then so we have our value we cast it our u32 to an f32 and we divide it by u32 max as f32. <coughs> so there you go. Now we multiply the frame buffer to also store floats between 0 and 1. And we can then go back. And from here, as you can guess, we say get pixel from x to y. And if this pixel is actually closer than the current depth, let's call this depth. Only then we want to draw our new pixel because close things go before far things. So this will be another small optimization. And if it actually is closer, then we want to immediately write that new depth as well. So we want to say set pixel x, y, z. A sort of correct order, but we forgot one important thing. And that's to clear it. 
Oh, we didn't see anything. Cool. That's because we got, forgot to clear it. So as you remember, if we initialize it with one as a float, it will be very far away. And of course, we need to clear it every frame with being as far away as possible. So we'll say frame buffer clear. And the, the equivalent of one as a float will be the maximum of our U32 because that's what we're defining by. So we need to clear like that every frame. And if we run it now, we'll see magic. So, as you can see, oh, 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 oh. I was really wondering why it didn't do anything. It's like, oh, damn, am I that bad? And there you go. So right now we're visualizing our normals. They're nicely moving in world space. So as you can see, blue is always forward, red is always to the left, and green is always up. And the depth is rendered correctly. One problem still, if we resize the window, the depth is not correct anymore because we're not resizing our depth, resizing our depth buffer. So we can fix this by a very simple hack. We can just say if the frame buffer dot width doesn't equal the depth buffer dot width, or if the height is not equivalent anymore, we just make a new depth buffer. So depth buffer equals frame buffer new frame buffer dot width <clears throat> frame buffer dot height. And there you go. So there you have it. A 3D model loaded from a GLTF file. You can add uh, shading at this point if you wanted to. So you could use the normal to have a lighting direction and you could shade it however you wanted. As you can see, it's a bit slow though. This is a 4K monitor. If I make it full screen, it's very slow. We can make it a bit faster by compiling in release mode. This will take some time because we never did that before. So it needs to recompile our libraries. We can say cargo run and then dash dash release. This will run it in release mode. I'll skip forward to when it's built. Ah, and there you go. So as you can see, it's a lot smoother now. And even if I make it full screen on 4K, it looks quite nice. One thing still, it's being stretched out because we're not actually giving it the correct aspect ratio. So instead of just saying one, we can say uh, aspect ratio, aspect ratio, pure board. And then we can say frame buffer width as a 32 divided by our frame buffer with height as a 32. And we can pass that instead of one. So if we run it now again, let's run it in release mode again. You'll see that even if I make it full screen, the aspect ratio is correct. So that was it for this tutorial. Next tutorial, we'll be loading our textures in. And we're using the texture coordinates to put them on our 3D model and we'll even add some 3D lighting. So I hope to see you next time. Bye.